panel leader and coordinator, if you can start introducing yourself, the panelists, the topic, please. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Muzin. So welcome everyone to this panel discussion. My name is Eva Murray. I'm a senior evangelist for Snowflake. And yeah, I'm here uh, to, to chat with our panelists about the challenges in the whole digital and automation process and what that means. And we did have a bit of an exchange ahead of time. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think there will be probably in the audience a few nodding heads of shared pain, but hopefully also some lessons learned from our panelists that you can take away and uh, try at home. So um, we have Jose Maria, we have Ricardo, Francis, Leonardo and Igor. Um, in that order, if you could please introduce yourselves um, and share one challenge that you face during automation and in that process. Okay, I think I was the first one. Well, Jose Sabater, I work at the Smart Factory for Scania Group. Uh, I'm located in Sweden as of now. Uh, and if I have to talk about one challenge we face in Scania when it comes to digital transformation, it is legacy systems and incompatibility with new technologies. Thank you. And we'll go over to Ricardo. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Ricardo Pica. I'm heading the operations transformation for Sandy Coromant, which is part of Sandy Group. I'm in Milan, but the company is a Swedish public company. Well, one of the key challenges you know, that we had in uh, while releasing the digital transformation is mostly related to the change of mindset, you know, becoming technology agnostic and being more led by the by the business needs. Uh, so meaning not starting from the technology, but really starting from what was needed from the business. And this was driven by the fact that COVID is pushing you to have a bottom line impact. And this means that business needs becomes first, technology becomes second. This was one of the challenges we had, changing of the mindset. Yeah, and that change, we'll get into this a bit further down the track, but that change is so important to be managed as well. Uh, Francis, let's hear from you. Yes, uh, so my name is Francis Rossignol. I'm in charge of the Smart Factory Initiative for one of the entity of Safran, which is a Safran lending system, 7,000 people. Today, my main challenge is due to the context we are facing in aerospace. The point is, uh, all are convinced that we need to be prepared for the, when the situation will recover in the next two or three years to be more competitive because the competition will be harder. And meanwhile, we have to invest to work on smart factory project with less cash available. Okay, so this is a big challenge. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. Let's hear from Leonardo. Mm -hmm. Yes, nice uh, to meet all you guys. So Leonardo Sergi, I, <laughs> IoT Innovation Director in Higher Europe. Uh, so the big challenge we are facing right now, so after some years of uh, uh, digitalization of a complex footprint of factories, now the big the big challenge from to us is how to move to the next uh, to the next steps. So the real smart industry. So how to use the data uh, from this digitalization that we have made to get a real information and then be able to use uh, uh, to predict uh, and, and so on. So and the real challenge is not uh, the technology, but how to create uh, uh, the business starting point. So how to convince uh, a full company to invest on something that we know it will have a big impact, a big, uh, let me say, uh, return of money, return of an investment, but how to create this kind of business case and how to create the uh, confidence around that. Yeah, and that's, I think that's one of those, you know, magic things that how do we communicate and really sell out the business value so that there is the trust in, okay, let's go down and do this change. Um, now, finally, Igor, would you also please introduce yourself to everyone? Yeah, hello, everybody. Great to be here. I'm Igor Rotin, Chief Data Scientist in Leaper Airspace. I have been involved in data science, artificial intelligence, uh, some contributed time. 
if I would say about the big, if I try to describe one big challenge, it's, it's probably to drive AI innovation in our time, COVID time, and uh, in respect to mind change, mindset change. Yeah, so that is already becoming a common theme. Um, I can hear that there. It's right, it's right. <laughs> So thank you to all of you for the introduction. And um, I do want to also engage the audience, at least to some extent. So if anyone in the audience wants to also share what their challenge is, please do feel free to type in the chat. And um, what we'll do now is we'll head over to some questions for us to discuss. And um, another call to the audience, if you do have a question you want to pose that is of interest to the general audience. It's not like a super specific, you know, error technology question that you're just very curious about, but something that, you know, we can make part of this round table, please feel free to share it. And I'll try to weave it into our conversation. So with the current uh, COVID situation, it's really forced a lot of organizations to focus on digital transformation. And I know there has been this joke going around, you know, who was in charge of your digital transformation? Was it your CEO, your CFO, or was it COVID that actually forced you to do it? Um, and then there's also that pressure to really show results from that. And at the same time, like we already heard, organizations have fewer resources to actually invest and make it happen. So what I would like to start with in terms of our question is, what are some effective ways that all of you have found, or some of you have found to find that balance between moving forward while also dealing with the uncertainty and maybe some budget constraints. Um, and let's start with Ricardo. So thank you very much uh, about this question. One of the things that uh, I was thinking about, it's really that the crisis and the pandemic, it's obliging you to move from what I call the desert of pilots, where you are doing user cases here and there, sometimes the return of investment is not fully clear, to really focus on few initiatives that are relevant and scalable. So the pandemic has obliged us, what I, what I call killing, uh, has obliged us to kill fashionable digital and really to focus only on material digital transformation. Material digital transformation that goes into the direction of cost reduction and cost avoidance. So has pushed us to prioritize and scope better the digital transformation. That is what I see from, from the challenges that we have. And I really like how you, how you classified those because um, I think it's really helpful. There's so many things that fall under digital transformation, but some, I guess we could also call them nice to have and the really big things that are really important, they are non-negotiable. Um, does has someone else approached it in a similar way? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, go on, go on, go on, please. Go ahead, okay. Francis. Yes, with similar way, I, I believe you need to, even you have less money, uh, less capacity, you do not, you should not stop quick win. Because quick win, something you can do immediately, You you give, you give confidence on digital benefit. And then regarding a more uh, extensive project uh, requiring more uh, resources, you have to have a, a demonstration of what the benefits are uh, working closely with a business. But do not avoid working uh, uh, on the quick win anyway. Yeah, I agree with that because and we've mentioned mindset before, it is so important to give people confidence, especially right now, but also to have something to build on, right? The quick win could be phase one of the big long-term goal, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can add that uh, actually for us at Scania, digitalization has to some extent has had the opposite effect. It has had the effect of uh, our management saying, oh, digital is the way forward and we can cut costs that we had before if we use digital technologies or new technologies and therefore helping the, this digital transformation. So I would say that even uh, COVID has been one of the biggest uh, digital evangelists or digital pushers in the last uh, year at least. And uh, maybe we would have been in a situation we were able to have this panel discussion in five years, like all digital, instead we have 
in one year time, it's quite normal to sit from different countries all in the same room discussing uh, these topics. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And it's interesting to hear that they recognize if we invest now, it's going to save us money rather than being reluctant to invest because it costs money. Um, Leonardo, I know you wanted to also add uh, some comments to this question. Yeah, exactly. Just to reinforce the fact that that is exactly the way we are working. So to look for a, a quick win, uh, let me say, just creating a pilot project, uh, identify uh, one potential place uh, where we can put uh, a little investment, but with an easy and quick return, in a way just to create the knowledge uh, of uh, what can be done if we escalate uh, at a different level, uh, maybe involving more factories, more line and so on. So uh, I totally agree on the approach that was shared by Francis before, and uh, this is exactly the same way we are, we are working on. So because uh, the, the real risk we have today is to have too much data but an ability to get information. So we are really flooded by data, too many. Nobody really is anymore able to go inside and understand what these data are telling to us. And this is the real challenge and the reason why we need even more and more analysts uh, and the ability to work on AI and this kind of technologies because uh, uh, today is easy to reach terras of bytes uh, of, of data and quite hard to understand what they mean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think, so some of you are from, oh, sorry, does someone else want to add something? I just uh, would like to add uh, that uh, uh, nowadays common interesting challenges for AI, but actually AI should work in this uncertainty situation. This is actually base of AI in data science. And I would uh, see that like a really big chance for, uh, for digital transformation nowadays. Absolutely. And, and with AI, having that, bring that agility of, let's test this. Okay, not what we were looking for. Let's test something else. That is, right, what we need right now when we're dealing with constantly changing environments and factors and decisions and regulations and all of that. And, and Igor, I want to come back to you with the next question. So to set the scene, when we look at established organizations that have been around sometimes for decades, maybe even longer, um, there can be a struggle to find the agility and the drive to really achieve digital transformation because there might be some really long-standing processes in place and a complex technology landscape. So Igor, in your um, experience, have you found that the digital transformation and that change happen from the top, or does it get triggered more organically bottom up? I would say both. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> at, at a group level, such Safra, you know, the challenge is to, to find the appropriate balance between top-down approach where you share big bone, I would say, investment, a big project where you, you get benefit from synergy do not replicate uh, effort on uh, proof of consent and so on. And at the same time, you need to keep the dynamic agility from each side close to the business. So it's maybe it's, a difficult, it's an easy answer, but you have to, to, to find the, the good balance between top-down top down and bottom approach. There's no miracle, I believe. <clears throat> Igor, over to you. I think you, you also yeah. have starting a comment there. Yeah, I fully agree that uh, we need to use to leverage two approaches, bottom up and vice versa, in order to find the synergy. Because actually, uh, the whole stuff connected to digital transformation, AI, data science is a pretty agile uh, process, uh, which uh, uh, which can really quickly um, adjust to current situation. And on the other hand, we have an establishment process, which are, as you said, as you mentioned, running in a big, um, uh, uh, inter uh, in a big corporation. And uh, I think that it's, uh, I would say it's uh, art to find this balance, to find the right balance and drive this digitalization in this circumstance. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, I do want to build on that question, actually go over to Ricardo and Jose um, to start off with. Have you, either of you, seen an appetite in more traditional industries where I believe you operate um, to learn from new digital businesses and startups? And if, if you have seen that, what are some ideas that excite you? Well, Here we I can go ahead, Ricardo. Oh, no, Jose, please go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> so I would say that uh, I can answer that question uh, in two ways. One is to, uh, with all these uh, new digital initiatives, we work very closely with startups and new companies that have uh, brilliant ideas. And many times these ideas come from these small companies uh, that just have you know, a eureka moment. Uh, but I can also mention that, for example, in one of the uh, presentations from yeah, one hour, two hours ago, uh, one of our colleagues, Robert, was talking about this uh, flexibility of the new uh, businesses and how we need to be able to adapt to ever-changing environments and so on. And I think uh, if I have to pinpoint one very good idea, I think this uh, micro factories or mobile factories is something that will be very relevant in the future, especially with an industry like the automotive one that will be very fast changing in the coming years. Okay, thank you. Ricardo, anything to add there? Well, I just wanted to take your previous question and then take one. On the previous question, you should put your initiatives in a matrix. One dimension is scalability. The other dimension is impact. If you have high impact and high scalability, this becomes you know, a global initiative. For example, if you have to create and harmonize and enrich data lake of information from which you are sourcing the data, that's you know, a global project. If you're implementing a project which is improving, for example, a specific legacy in a site, for example, on maintenance, this is something that could have high impact, but it's local. So a blend of global initiatives and local initiatives, it's always quite good. Global coordination is needed not only to scale global projects, but it's needed also to be efficient and avoid the multiplication of proof of concepts in different sites that which are aiming to the same thing. Going back to your question, to your second question about uh, inspiration from working with uh, tech companies and uh, small, uh, let's say, uh, growing or uh, startup companies, we have a double experience. And I think you need to have both. You need to work with global big companies because they have big tech companies because they have the experience and they have already proof test many of their solutions. Okay. And, and that's fine. From the other side, sometimes these big tech companies are not so agile because they are just way too big. Okay. I'm thinking about some tech companies that have 10 times or 20 times the size of Sandvik, which is 10 billion company. Okay. From the other side, the startups, working with startups or niche companies, and we had an experience on advanced workforce planning, uh, it's very interesting because they are answering to your needs. So they're customizing and following you, and they're much more agile. Of course, they don't have the track record and experience from a big tech company, so they will fail, and they will fail with you. But at the end, their intention is really to respond to your needs. So I guess that a blend of both is needed. I hope I answer your question, Eva. You, you did, and I really, I really like that answer. And I think um, that is something that I've also observed kind of from the edges that the startups, like you say, they have they fulfill a need within a specific niche. They they create a very specific product that addresses one challenge or one pain point. But that might be exactly what you need to plug in to then serve your customers better as a whole. So. Um, yeah, so I like the, you know, finding the balance. It's it's so often about finding a balance. If um, I may add uh, something about the stakeholders in this ecosystem model, I would say, you do not uh, forget the academic, I mean the schools, because you need to work with the schools because you are preparing the resources and the expert you need to develop your roadmap. You need to play uh, and uh, help the schools to grow in terms of uh, skills, to have the right people to, to make the project. I, I believe, I, I, I think about young people, but many schools have research activities. You have the capacity to, to have an internship, to have a, uh, engineers working on an RIT approach. Not very expensive, but you prepare the future. So that could be part of this project and your development. 
Definitely. And the, the payoff yeah. is in the long term because yeah. you already know the person. If you want to hire them when they finish with school with the university degree, um, yeah. and they already know your business. So that's a, a very smart approach. And I want to um, I want to move over to a slightly different topic and uh, start with Leonardo here, because when we think about digital transformation, we also need to think about scaling and a a very common hurdle to scaling and, for example, scaling things around data, your data environment analytics, is that many organizations have silos. It could be within a department or geographical silos. And what I want to ask you and um, Leonardo, specifically you to start off with is how common are silos and the silo mentality? Absolutely, you're touching a very, let me say, great point of uh, almost uh, all the big companies. So it's very, it's very common. And uh, as you were mentioning, silos are at every level, are regional, uh, are because are geographical, are uh, by roles, uh, by by layers of the organization. So uh, break the silos is the key. So of course, so we. You, it's, a, it's an investment that everybody has to do in order to reach the same target. So it's very important, I think, uh, uh, the message that has been that has to be passed by the high level of the company uh, that uh, we have uh, a common target uh, and we are all working in the same direction. We are, let me say, all going in the same direction and uh, and these silos must be break at every level because otherwise uh, you will never be able to reach. So share the target, share the uh, the, the experience uh, and uh, I think this uh, this uh, uh, this let me say era of uh, uh, smart working uh, is making uh, this uh, sometimes even more uh, complex because uh, uh, the the kind of point of interaction that usually you can create when you have uh, meetings all together uh, meeting uh, maybe just around the coffee machine uh, that are all important moments where you break these silos and you create a network and communication and so on. So, uh, and, and of course, it, it is, a, let me say, a kind of human silos. And uh, in addition to that, there are also, there is another layer that is the digital silos. Uh, what I mean uh, are the data that are easy, uh, sorry, it's not easy to reach uh, from everybody because uh, we don't have a real uh, data integration, a common uh, way and protocols to share and so on. So, uh, it's a complex argument. I don't think there is a, a, a single way to solve it uh, as because this is a problem that is affecting uh, big multinational companies, but also even smaller, smaller companies for sure uh, suffer less on that. Uh, but big company is really one of the most complex area to solve at all. So it mm -hmm. it, it's about people, it's about process, it's about communication, it's about it's tools. So many areas where we have to work to improve this. Yeah, and I'd love to hear from the others as well, what your experience has been around silos and the challenges they pose for scaling, but also if you've had any success in addressing them and removing silos in, in the organizations that you've worked in or with. Of course, if you want, I can add even more or somebody yeah. else want to add. Uh, I so I of course, uh, is, there are good is... stories, but uh, I would like also to leave the speech to the other otherwise. I just wanted to uh, mention you talked about uh, geographical silos, but also functional ones. And maybe I can highlight a big silo that we see or that we have had in the past uh, decades. And it's uh, the, the separation between the business organization or the production organization and the IT organization mm -hmm. and how they are. Uh, completely separated and we don't have the competence in the business to do the IT side and we don't have the IT uh, they don't have the competence to do the business side and this is one of the great silos that we're aiming to break with these new digital technologies by bringing uh, hybrid engineers or hybrid people that have uh, a common competence and that can uh, bridge this gap yeah and, and I I fully agree sorry I fully agree because this was the my same, the same comment and there are a lot of white papers. Some of them are saying you should bypass IT if you want to do digital transformation. <laughs> Some of them are really, and this is quite extreme, uh, because the IT per example that we have today, it's a very good IT, but it was an old traditional IT. And the competence that you need for a digital transformation are completely different. You know, you need to have solution architects, you need to have user experience, you need to have back-end, you know, developers. So it's a completely different blend of uh, competences that you need. And you have two choices. 
you take somebody who has a domain knowledge and then you uplift its competences by in, embedding some yeah. digital competences or from the other way around, you start hiring people which have already the, these IT competences that you need. If I could say the way we did, we didn't bypass IT. Uh, we started having IT embedded within operations. So for example, in the management on the digital transformation, IT is part of my management team. And it's not a separated function. In Safran, I would say uh, what we like, what we did, what we do so far, is to put in the same organization, people in charge of IT, uh, smart factory, this is my role, uh, but also the, the lean organization, people in charge of uh, improvement plan. It's a way to, to have a, uh, to have uh, all business people uh, involved in the business for competitiveness completely aligned with IT and digital people, L uh, reporting to the same uh, uh, organization. So in our case, they don't report to the same organization. They have adopted two operations and a full line to IT, but still they are part of the management team or part of the implementation teams. There is no implementation team which is cross-functional. One of the requirements to start a project is that you have a cross-functional team with the right stakeholders in. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you don't have the blessing and you will not start any project. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And I think it really forces that collaboration and communication, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. At the beginning, is, it looks like maybe strange or it looks like this is forced, but then you understand that this is the best way to, to work. And, uh, and then if you also implement an agile you know, methodology with sprints, you know, failing fast, you, know, you get to see results and you get dynamic between the teams. So I think this is the right way to go. Not easy, but the right way to go. Uh, another way also is uh, to make some awareness about what is data. Uh, what is uh, machine learning just by a specific training to all the manager, business manager, just to, to, to do some uh, awareness about what is data, what are the challenges, and some, uh, some basic uh, knowledge about uh, the techni technology behind, just what is needed to understand better each other. Yeah. So I do Maybe. want to, and I, and I see... Have... Sorry. I just wanted to add uh, maybe that Francis mentioned before that we need to work a lot with the uh, universities or with uh, uh, yeah, the people that will be the future of the companies. And uh, I think transmitting this feeling of uh, this uh, hybrid competence need is also something where we can start building the new generations to be ready for to fulfill the, the roles that are needed in the future organizations. Mm. The, if just to add the point, a little point on that that Jose was mentioning is a great point. Uh, I what I'm observing is the especially in the universities that uh, the the way to train the new engineers or new guys uh, is changing. So in the past, uh, till I don't know ten years ago, an engineer was just an engineer. So it was a guy teaching about electronics, about mechanics, and so on. Now all the new engineers, or some of them, many at least, uh, are coming outside with really just a mix of uh, of knowledge and competencies just uh, there also universities are already understanding this need of the companies and they are already starting to prepare a uh, new generation of uh, uh, technician and managers that they have already this double side uh, of the medal not the two faces so the business side and the technical side is uh, is great we must uh, uh, push on that and even uh, uh, encourage the university to continue in this way and also transmit the message to the new, to the students that is the right way because this is the kind of people we need for the future. And we need the, I, I like your approach of, you know, the universities need to teach what the businesses need, but also they need to collaborate and say, okay, what about these things like internships, getting people real life experience so they see why they're learning all these things and also oh maybe there's an area that really interests me i better enroll in this additional course or you know swap some courses because there's nothing like real life experience real world experience to really show you what you're doing is going to be useful but also these are all the things that you'll be facing so how are you going to prepare yourself for it hmm. 
I just wanted to add one thing, which is yeah. obvious, but it sometimes it's underestimated. When you're working with academics, you should call for a project. Give them a real project, mm -hmm. something you know, on which they can work. And if they fail, that's fine. They will learn. But they, if they have success, they will see the impact. And a project that you need to solve a problem that you have. This is extremely important. So when you're going yeah. to academics, you have a kind of bidding from different teams or different people on a specific project that they have to solve. So you call for a project and then you will get the right people in. And I would say that COVID actually has helped us realize it's not as complicated as it has as we maybe made it in the past because we can run all of this in a virtual environment so we can reach an even bigger audience of students. It doesn't just have to be one university. It could be a hackathon style event, right? Where we reach out to a global audience and say, here's a problem here for you to solve and here's a prize you can win if you help us um, and bring in that element of gamification as well. Now, I do want to um, use the next few minutes before we have to wrap up because we had an audience question and it nicely connects to a question I wanted to ask anyway. When we look at these digital transformation projects with the new technologies that come into organizations, there's going to be the question of what's the ROI. And we talked earlier about, you know, budget constraints and expectations and measuring the effect on the bottom line. So I was curious, have you identified KPIs that help you measure the outcomes in some sort of quantifiable terms? And, and this is from the audience, we'll be, build this in as well. How can you fail fast? in this journey of achieving a return on investment? Oh, yes. Taking the example of augmented reality, okay? Yes. We have definitely identified and measured. We have defined a methodology from the beginning uh, uh, at the selection of a use case from the beginning. We estimate the impact in terms of uh, quality first, productivity, uh, uh, knowledge, uh, capitalization. So we have measured through the demonstrator what could be the benefit with the demonstrator that help to uh, duplicate and extend the usage. Another example, mm -hmm. uh, machine connectivity uh, using data, the, the key parameter is uh, operational efficiency. Okay, if you, if, if you save a few points, you can measure very uh, important uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, KPIs. And Not... could, could you mention an example? You mentioned quality. Yeah. What's an example KPI for quality, just so we all understand a bit better? Uh, when, uh, for example, when you product, you assemble product, you deliver to the customer, an example, a landing gear or an engine, you, you, you need to reduce the number of non-quality exported to the customer. This is a very important uh, KPI because you, you, you create burden to the customer. You have to rework, it's costly. So you measure the number of cases, you export a non-quality, which is found at the customer. Okay, this so is basically, good... if they are not happy with the quality because they identify there's an, a faulty part or something, yeah. of, of course you want to reduce that, but that is how it's measured. You see how many versus how many good high quality items. Before, after. Each case has an average cost. You could, uh, this is a baseline to, to measure how a solution could reduce the cost uh, due to this uh, misquality. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else has some KPIs they'd like to share or a way that has worked for them in terms of measuring the ROI of the digital transformation? I just have a comment. I think the role of finance here is quite important. Mm -hmm. The return of investment of any investment, digital or not, needs to be certified by finance and needs to be outside the digital, uh, the digital function. This is to avoid conflict of interest. I think this is a good practice beyond, you know, selecting the right KPI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good point. Uh, that... Here in Sweden, we, we also sometimes more lenient to accept uh, softer benefits. As mm -hmm. for example, uh, operator ergonomics, which you could also translate into less sick leave and then also cost uh, reduction. But uh, you can argue for projects just by improving ergonomics of uh, operator stations or how uh, the assembly line would look like in terms of uh, yeah, 
how operators uh, perform the tasks and so on. So, um, and to add to that, I can say that when it comes to new initiatives, uh, Industry 4.0, uh, when it comes to the first phases from the idea generation to uh, pre-study, we really don't look so much into ROI. Uh, maybe it comes a bit more important for us later on when it comes into real uh, pilots or implementations in the production units. And there it's really justifiable and we need to have a strong business case if you want to argue for scaling it up. And there it can come this finance unit that can be like a auditor uh, in a way so that uh, you are really, you don't have any conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Just to, and, to and add, way, okay. Oh, okay. So, sorry, sorry, go on. Yeah. I go, okay. Uh, yeah, one, one, one KPI that I really like a lot that unfortunately is not always so easy to, to manage is about intellectual properties. And so the, the creation of patents on is a value, is a really, sometimes it's not easy to make it tangible, but in reality is a translating increase in the value of the company itself. So it must be included it and uh, uh, it's a culture point uh, that, uh, of course, it's, I really love it. So, so yeah. more than the pure money and the ROI and payback time and so on, that, of course, uh, everybody looks at that, especially on business side. But uh, coming from more, let me say, innovation and research area, I like even the, the parts of intellectual properties. Great. And I love that you brought up mindset again, uh, because what I would like to take the last two minutes is to focus very briefly on communication because as we're transforming the organizations into something more digital communication is key we all agreed to that early on i would love for you to share your top one or two suggestions for getting communication right as part of that process yep. we'll start with igor yeah, I just uh, would like to add that it's very useful to use kind of successful metrics, which should not be only concentrate on ROI, but also on the soft, uh, not only hard, but also soft features. And how to support communication. Yeah, you need to do your storyteller, I would say, and communicate with your C management uh, on uh, in order to describe uh, achievement in the digitalization program. Okay. And what about Ricardo? What are your top tips around communication? Yeah, I, I would uh, quote uh, Game of Thrones. And there is one of the major actors, which is Tyron Lannister, which is saying, what is uniting people? Uh, un uh, uniting people, it's not armies, it's not uh, gold, it's not flags, okay? What is really uniting people, it's a good story. So when you're doing a digital transformation, you need a good story because nothing can stop a good story. And that's something that in communication we need to think about. I love that quote. Very good. Thank you for sharing. Francis, what are your top suggestions? Fra Francis, did you want to share some as well? Could you repeat? I didn't catch what you said. Yeah, your top suggestions for communication during this transformation process. Oh, yeah. Um, from my experience, let's take, take the example of augmented reality. We did a lot of video, okay? We did a promote a lot. As soon as we have a successful use case, we make a video, we populate the video, we make presentation internally, outside. You need to, uh, to, to do some marketing around what you do, about yeah. around the benefit. Around, you let people talk about uh, the successful project. This is the way, by example, lead by example. <laughs> it's, that's, that's a great suggestion that, you know, the self-promotion, but for everyone's awareness. What about you, Leonardo? Do you have a tip for the audience? One minute, I, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think also also the communication has to transform. Has to transform because uh, uh, we want to promote. Uh, we must promote what we are doing. Uh, how the world is changing. So also the communication has to be done, uh, leveraging in the new technologies, the new way. Starting from social, uh, starting with a more uh, let me say, interactive way to communicate. Uh, so no more email, no more letter, no more advertising on paper or TVs, but really move also the communication to the new age because that transformation is a, is a change and also the communication has to change. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And we'll let leave the last word to Jose. 
What's your suggestion? I can keep it brief, but I would say with communication comes a high level of transparency. So if you're very transparent of the project you're going and you expose them to everyone in the company, then uh, you can reach out to a lot of people and get them on board. Uh, and I would say cross-functional teams working on the projects is also a very important way of communicating and transmitting the feeling of going forward. Right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I really enjoyed that conversation and I am pretty sure that the audience did as well because the numbers stayed very 